Welcome back, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the final session in today's study day in honor of Dr. Heather Elgood, the Founder and Director Emerita of the Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art. Our final panel is a discussion, a kind of in conversation, if you will, between two senior figures within the Asian art um, commercial world. Um, so we're discussing the Asian art market, its challenges and opportunities in the 21st century with two speakers today. Um, the first speaker joins us from Christie's New York, um, Olivia Hamilton, who is head of the Department of Chinese Works of Art at Christie's in New York. He joined Christie's in 2016 um, after spending five years at another major international auction house and has worked on numerous projects, collections and significant sales um, with Christie's. So we're very grateful for Olivia's time, her expertise, and for joining us today as an alumni of the course to speak on her, her current work and current profession. I'm also thrilled to welcome Edward Gibbs, who joins us um, from Austria, but in his capacity as chairman and head of department for the Middle East and Indian department at Sotheby's in London. Um, Edward joined Sotheby's in 2003 and has had an extensive career in addition to the auction world working with museums and um, uh, cultural institutions, including not least of all the, um, the one of the original forms of, of this course as a partnership between SOAS and Sotheby's in, in its earliest inception some, some years ago. So Edward, thank you very much for bringing your, uh, your expertise, your insights to us today. Um, and I'd like to begin by asking a question to both of you, posing it first to Olivia, um, to ask if you could speak to the main challenges and opportunities that you, you face in your particular area of the Asian art world in the 21st century. So Olivia, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Malcolm. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, before we jump, in, jump into your, your pose question, I, I first wanted to say, I mean, obviously I've, I've been here in New York for six years, it's officially over half of, of my career, extraordinarily time flies. But really, most importantly, I'm such a proud alumna of the SOAS Diploma course. And I can honestly say it was a completely pivotal year for me. I had given up my legal career in Hong Kong with absolutely no plan whatsoever. And very fortuitously for me, I met Hetty with her, all her persuasiveness and charm and her confidence. She set me on a completely new path. Um, and it's such an honor for me to be here today, simply to say thank you to Hetty. Um, I think we're all so proud of the diploma that she's built and long may it continue. This is a, a sort of very basic introduction so we can get on to that important question of what are the challenges facing the art market today and, and where do we think it's going to go. But I think it's worth sort of considering what we really mean when we talk about the works of art market, the Chinese works of art market. Um, it's a huge topic and I think that's one of the things that may break up a bit in, in the future. It's, it's an interesting point for discussion. And I'd be very interested to know what other people think. Um, because as a quick reminder, you know, we're talking about 5,000 years of history from Neolithic, from the Shang Dynasty, from the 13th century BC. We have these wonderful jades, incredible bronzes, some of the most technically accomplished bronzes in the world, uh, going through to Tang pottery and then scooting over absolutely everything in between to get to Ming furniture and the brightness and, and color of the Qing dynasty. So we're talking about bronzes, pottery, gilt bronze Buddhist pieces, sculptures, gold and silver, textile, silk, cloisonne, organic material like lacquer, uh, furniture. It encompasses so much that we, it's kind of astonishing to me that we define Chinese works of art just as one big group, still in auctions, and at least in the West, um, that that's, they, these all really have independent markets. So perhaps that's something that we should start talking more about the market for song ceramics, the market for archaic bronzes. Uh, and this is of course without even mentioning paintings in which I'm not an expert in the slightest, but I will certainly get many clients coming to me saying, what do you mean you don't understand paintings? But I'm sure that all of you on the diploma will understand just how much we absorb and, and need to understand simply in, in works of art themselves. Um, a quick history lesson, mostly because I really love this old picture, which is from the early 20th century, of what auctions used to look like. Uh, they did have the pieces sitting there and they would be brought around on trays, so clients could inspect them, inspect the condition. Uh, we have interesting technical solutions to that now for clients who can't be in the room. Uh, and, uh, and then the bidding would begin. So I imagine quite slow, quite sedate, but probably very fun. And things are really different now. You see a lot more screens, a lot more drama, 
uh, a lot more clerks making sure everything goes smoothly. Many people sitting in the room, watching screens, looking at their catalogs. And here at the top, I don't know if you can see my mouse as well, but there are sky boxes. Uh, so important clients can actually have anonymity while attending an auction. And this of course is the view from behind the phone banks where we're all incredibly busy all day managing the phones. And, uh, and that's, that's from pre-COVID. So things have changed since, and um, that'll be an interesting topic for conversation to, to how we've managed the challenges of the last 18 months. But I think the, the biggest change that I really wanted to highlight is the entry of the mainland Chinese into the market. Uh, it really happened, started to happen in 2010. Uh, by 2011, it was very obvious um, that the market had really totally changed. Uh, prices were going sky high and um, there was a lot of enthusiasm. It was, it was a little frothy, it was extremely unpredictable. It's also when I started, so <laughs> it was quite a challenge when people tell me, oh, it's something, it's worth $5,000 and it sells for 150. Um, it's very hard to get your head around, but uh, things are a little bit more stable now. And I wanted to sh show you quickly a bar chart. And this is just the Chinese works of art sales from New York and Christie's since March, 2010. And you can see the huge spike in 2011 when things really started to go through the roof. It also went very high in, in September 2013. And things are much more stable now in, in a good way. It's less frenetic, it's, it's less unpredictable. The buyers are much more experienced. But this bar chart is really only showing part of the story. Uh, and that's because it's what we call the various owners sales. So those are the kind of headline sales, maybe you know, ours is entitled important Chinese ceramics and works of art. And it's mixed property from mixed consigners. But what has really taken off since about 2015 was the number of single owner sales that we have and how successful those are. Uh, so while you may look at this and say, okay, things are, things are not great. Look here at, for example, March, 2017, our various owner sale made a total hammer plus premium of 13 million. But we also had the sale of important Chinese art from the Fujita Museum, which just for 31 lots made 262 million US dollars. And that's really putting Chinese art sales and putting Chinese art objects at a price point that is comparable for some of the most famous paintings, impressionist and modern post-war sales that seem to grab all the headlines. So delightful for us. Um, it was a hugely exciting sale. It was the most valuable Asian art sale ever sold, um, the most valuable inst institutional collection ever sold. And I did just say here, sixth highest collection sale ever sold. I believe it is now the eighth, but that's putting it in that top 10, along with the Rockefeller sale at Christie's, the Taubman sale at Sotheby's, you know, all those sales that have an enormous impact in the, in the art market in general, not just Asian art. So again, just to reiterate that point, we have uh, another single owner collection sale, excuse me, which was the Irving sale. It was in March, 2019. This is not from an institution, but Florence and Herbert Irving were themselves almost an institution in New York. They were incredibly generous benefactors to the Met and the Asian art wing of the Met is named after them. So it was a hugely resonant name. And in terms of telling that story and, and marketing that, it was all built around who they were and their personal collection. And that really tells in the results as well. And I couldn't not mention Rockefeller. So here you go, here was the top Chinese lot from the Rockefeller sale. Um, it made an absolutely astonishing price of 2.7 million US dollars. And again, that is very much tied to the name. I mean, of course that name is enormously resonant in the US. I think everybody in Europe also knows the name Rockefeller, but the Chinese buyers also really were seduced by it. And for a bowl that had condition issues, it had a few nicks to the rim and it had four hairline cracks. It's really an astonishing price. So that's sort of what the market is looking for. And I wanted to put this up here because it's um, something that's a little bit controversial of the ideas of museums deaccessioning. So this is something that happens actually quite regularly in the US. It's um, part of overall collections care and management. And I think there is a good reason, a good, a good argument to be made for it, but I can sort of 
almost hear the intake of breath from across the Atlantic <laughs> when you mention things like museums deaccessioning. Um, again, it may, it may be an interesting discussion point for this for this panel discussion. Um, but it, it, in terms of the market, it's highly appealing. Um, buyers love the idea that something was in the Met. Um, it often has provenance back to the 19th century, so authenticity issues can be less concerning. Um, it's 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 hugely important, and it's something that's become increasingly prevalent in the last year because the A AAMD, the American Association of Museum Directors, has issued a directive to say that museums in the US are now allowed to use the proceeds of sale for collections care and not just for acquisitions. So previously, you know, if you sold, Matt made 13.8 million out of the sale, that would have all gone into acquisitions. And now there's a small window of opportunity, uh, of two year window, when that could go, for example, to paying the salaries of collectors, excuse me, of curators. And that counts as collections care. And that is due to the, the stress that COVID has had on, on the museums. So throwing that out there is an interesting discussion point. Um, just obviously these are sort of the things that buyers are looking for what is interesting to buyers when they look at an object. You know, artistic quality, rarity, condition is hugely important, excuse me. Um, just to, academic importance is important, but it's an interesting thing to note in the market that it's not necessarily correlate to what the prices might be. And there are external influences for the market too. I mean, some positive, you know, recent museum exhibitions can create a new understanding of the art um, and therefore boost interest in an area that may have been less interesting. Uh, so likewise, new academic research, but there, there are a lot of red tape as well. And I think at least in the Chinese works of art market, it uh, has increased in the last couple of years, um, particularly with uh, the previous president here of President Trump. So laws and regulations, trade wars, tariffs, and of course, coronavirus. Um, and that was just a very brief introduction to what I think um, the market is looking at right now. And um, over to Malcolm and Edward. Thank you so much, Olivia. I'm, I have so many questions to follow up on that. You've, you've touched on so many things that we've spoken about already today. So that in a way, it's it's a wonderful chance, I hope, in the Q&A um, to connect some of the dots here. We've, we've had conservators at the British Library talking about the, the challenges they face in caring for collections there. We've had um, discussions about the, the kind of the remit of the museum reaching much beyond its collection. So interesting to think of that in the context of, of capital and resourcing in a time of enormous difficulty. So I really hope we can come back to those those conversations and and you can give us some insights into to how this happens from a, a commercial perspective. Uh, but Edward, I'd like to turn to you now with our a kind of opening question uh, to ask you to speak to the opportunities and the challenges uh, that you face in your particular area of the Asian and indeed Middle Eastern art market in the 21st century. So Edward, thank you very much for being here and over to you. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, I hope you can all hear me clearly and see me clearly. Um, well, first, before I address the question, I, I'd just like to extend my, my um, deepest respect and heartfelt thanks to Hetty for all that she's done for me over the years, um, starting with accepting me onto the course, because I know the other person who interviewed me, who's uh, Dr. Philip Denwood, who was the head of department at the time, um, wanted to turn me down because I had a rather mediocre degree from Cambridge. And he wrote in his interview notes that I was clearly somebody who was only interested in meeting beautiful young women. And I mean, I was initially quite insulted by that, but actually it turned out to be quite an insightful comment because I met Hetty and I met my future wife on the course. So it was really a life changing decision for me to come onto the course. And I'm hugely grateful um, to Hetty. And um, I think it's an extraordinary testament to her that she stayed with these courses over 30 years and she's really embodied them and given them you know, their particular color and character and made them into this huge international success um, with an extraordinary um, list of, of alumni um, in all areas of, of the art world. Um, in terms of the opportunities and challenges, um, they're manifold, but um, I just want to boil them down since time is of the essence just to two uh, one is the sort of traditional challenge of, of getting it right, of, of getting the expertise right and not getting egg on your face. And that, that is authenticating the object 
um, not being tripped up or fooled by fakes or forgeries, um, not being taken in by uh, things with um, false or, or fake provenance, um, and authenticating the work correctly and placing the correct value on it, because there's also a huge financial risk in our world. Um, and one area of expertise that we have to be at the top of constantly at the top of our game is, is getting the value right. Um, and I have a short video to play, which illustrates this. And if I could ask Patrick, perhaps if you could press the magic button. There are 10 criteria that Sotheby's specialists consider when assigning prices to art, jewelry, wine, watches, and more. This is how we determine the value of art. Authenticity. 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 In our field, that's quite an interesting area. Whatever you're looking at has to conform to all the elements required of that particular category. We're also looking at originality of the piece, if anything has been altered. Has that been noted or has that been done on the slide to make something look better than it is? Authenticity is really the soul of the object. The true and intended manifestation of an artist's idea. When you have verification that it's genuine in the most basic way. Authenticity is really part of our branding. Sotheby's basically is established over many years, very close relationships. That is where our expertise resides, relationships with artists, artist studios, their foundations, galleries, agents, dealers, all the people who put together the catalog resumes. A catalog resume is our best friend. Picasso is a great example. Extremely extensive catalog resume with thousands and thousands of works. The international standard is that if a work by Picasso is recorded in this book, it's considered authentic. If it's not in there, then we have a little bit of a problem. The collection of Mrs. Paul Mellon was a huge moment for Sotheby's, and she had a beautiful, bright blue Lucio Fontana work. It had been given to her as a gift. It had been kept in her house in Virginia forever and ever. Lucio Fontana has a foundation in Italy. They didn't have any record of it. So we actually ended up sending it to Italy. At the 11th hour, we got the word back that we could keep it in and it was going to be included in future catalog raisonnés. If there is no documentary evidence, then one would build a scholarly consensus. That's connoisseurship. Chinese connoisseurs have a saying that says, Shen. You open the door and you see the mountain right there in front of you. That visceral feeling, obvious feeling of authenticity. Most old masters aren't signed, and so quite often we'll say, oh, you know, it's, it's signed in every brush stroke, and we usually say it tongue in cheek, but we mean it. I've heard it described as trying to recognize someone's handwriting. I recognize this artist, but I don't quite know who it is. Where have I seen this hand before? Perhaps the way an artist always paints an ear or uses specific highlights on a cheekbone each time. Now technology has come so far that there are a lot of tests on the makeup of the object. You can take a sapphire and send it to the gemological laboratory and they will tell you where it came from, whether or not it's been heat treated. It's an expensive process, but we go through it for every diamond, every colored stone. You're always looking looking at the materials. Is the paper appropriate for the period? Is the weave of the canvas typical? Sometimes things need to pass the smell test. These were works that were used in temples, so they would usually have the scent of yak butter and incense. If it doesn't, sometimes you wonder where has it been? Anything that is worth something is going to be worth being faked. We cannot lower our guard no matter what object we're confronted with. They're copies of everything you know. There is a Abex artist who I've now seen a number of fake works on paper that come with the same documentation printed using the same typewriter. This like wonky little typewriter where the letters jump up and down. Different gallery names on these fake invoices, but I know to look out for the, those works, for example. N.S. Lowry. People think he's very, very easy to fake because sometimes people look at them and think, well, I could do that. But actually, conversely, it's that spontaneity that is the hardest to fake. I've always said that you can't forge a book, but in a celebrated case recently where a 17th century work by Galileo fooled great experts, it's just a reminder that you have to always be vigilant. Scholars were studying in, say, 1900, traveling around Europe with no photographs, just their memory and their extensive notes. They would have miscatalogued things. I always remember that in 1900, it was thought that there were 800 Rembrandts in the world, and in 2000, they're thought to be 250 Rembrandts in the world. Thank you.
Every year, maybe every two years, we are tasked with clearing out what we call aged inventory. So I was looking at a Rodin, brought to us in 1980. It was not authentic. The owner left it there. But essentially, there was no real expert body for Rodin prior to about 10 or 15 years ago. A gentleman named Jerome Leblay with the Musée Rodin in Paris initiated a project to actually go back to all of the foundry records and museum records. So I thought it would be worthwhile to show this to Jerome Leblay. I knew he was able to find markings on the inside of this bronze which led him to know exactly the month and the year in which it was cast. We then went on to this mission of tracking down the owner. We ended up having to hire a private investigator. They were deceased, but we tracked down their children. And you can imagine their joy in getting a call from Sotheby's saying they were the owners of this authentic Rodin, which was extremely valuable, and we actually then sold it for them. Um, that, that video is obviously produced by the marketing department. It, it, it's one of five, and you can find them all on YouTube if you're interested in following up. Um, you, some of you will have recognized Nicholas Chow in the video. Nicholas Chow, who's uh, now the chairman of Sotheby's in Asia, um, and, and another distinguished alumni of the course. Um, in fact, um, I was the the recipient of the Edward Chow Foundation Scholarship, that's his grandfather, um, which allowed me to go on the course in the first place with all fees paid by that foundation. Um, Edward Chow was one of the great um, sort of scholar connoisseurs of the 20th century, um, who had a remarkable and celebrated collection of Chinese ceramics, which I'm sure Olivia knows very well, and was sold in a multi-part hardback um, series of catalogues back in the 1970s, I think, or early 80s. Um, the, the second challenge uh, I wanted to highlight is, is a challenge that has faced us all, which is, of course, the challenge brought on by COVID and how we adapt and innovate, um, how we uh, transform our traditional platforms, such as the physical catalog, um, the exhibition, the live sale, and bring all of that to our clients, not just our historic and current clients, but new clients, um, how to reach and engage with our client base. And you know, that was um, an evolutionary challenge which hit us all um, over a year ago. And I think um, I, would, I would liken it to an asteroid strike. And I think when the asteroid hits, uh, you either evolve or you die. And um, I think all auction houses um, scrambled um, to embrace the virtual media. I think it's, Sotheby's had an advantage in that we had invested um, considerably in all of our digital platforms um, ahead of this crisis. Um, and we were already um, pioneering and piloting online sales um, from 2016 onwards. But those sales represented less than 20% of our auctions in 2019, and that figure has now flipped on its head where 80% of our sales are online and only 20% are live. Um, we continue to have what we call the marquee sales, which are the big sort of twice yearly or thrice yearly um, live events in New York and London. And we've televised these to reach a much wider audience. Um, they're live streamed. Uh, with the auctioneer Oli Barker, so our European chairman, um, situated in London, um, taking bids from television screens um, and television and um, telephone banks in New York, um, Paris, uh, Geneva, and Hong Kong. Um, they, they've been remarkably successful. These sales, I mean, more successful than we could ever have dreamt of, really, considering um, the. Uh, the, the newness of the technology and um, the fact that it was not tried and tested at all. But um, having partnered with Cheddar or Museum TV and um, Cheddar, uh, which is a television channel which is owned by our, our new owner, Mr. Patrick Drahi, um, the last contemporary and modern and impressionist sale, I think, was viewed by over a million people. So there's an there's extraordinary potential 
So it, whilst it represents a huge opportunity, a, a huge challenge, it, it also presents a massive opportunity to broaden our client base and to reach a whole new audience. And indeed, the statistics bear that up. Where last year, forty percent of Sotheby's clients were completely new to Sotheby's, and a, a, another very interesting and telling statistic: forty、uh, percent of those new buyers are under forty. So this digital technology has. Um, allow, has has a a, a, um, a serious upside to it, which is it allows us to engage with a whole new demographic and a whole new、um, younger、uh, younger generation of collectors,、uh, particularly in the sort、uh, sort of new categories、uh, such as luxury and sort of the upcycling market,、um, handbags, sneakers,、um, and、um, watches. And, and prints and multiples, and、um, I'm going to ask Patrick just to play another very short video, which illustrates this new innovative live streamed auction format. A very warm welcome to Sotheby's for what promises to be an historic evening. Eighteen million pounds, fifty million dollars. This is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. A multi-camera global live stream from around the world in real time. Sales spanning five hundred years of history. Last chance, and selling is yours. One million one, one million one hundred and fifty thousand is bid. The extraordinary Jean-Michel Le Basquiat on title head to new world record price. Four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand now, five hundred thousand, one million one, one million one hundred and fifty thousand. It's big. Fair warning. David Hockney, the splash from 1966, record-breaking at Sotheby's. The extraordinary Francis Bacon at seventy-four million dollars. Welcome, everyone. Kahinda, a very, very warm welcome to you. We feel very privileged to be with you there in your studio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's clear these innovations are here to stay. Edward, thank you. Those were very. I mean, that last one particularly was a very dramatic kind of、um, evocation of the, the the new technologies and, and innovations、um, that are sweeping the auction world globally. So, I think with with that kind of sentiment or tone in mind, I'd like to to follow up with a, a question for myself at first.、Um, but for those of you in the audience, we、um, we we welcome your questions. Please do click on the Q and A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen.、Um, but I'd like to ask. Focusing in on these adaptations, these new ways of of selling, of engaging collectors with with material, and the many other innovations that surround it, to what extent are these new innovative ways of of conducting an auction, of reaching collectors, and of of shaping taste for the future in your respective fields of Asian art? To what extent are these innovations?、Um, Kind of new creations of of, of, of ways of engaging.、Um, how much are they innovative, and how much are they adapting existing processes and practices? In essence, is the are auctions fundamentally changed? Are we now experiencing the same thing but in a different platform? Perhaps we can start with you, Olivia, and then and then come to you, Edward. Of course, thank you, Malcolm.、Um, a very interesting question. I think the fundamental principle of what we're doing at auction is 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 the same. We're attracting. As many bidders as possible, and trying to drive the price as high as possible, to the benefit of the consigner,、um, it it has completely changed. In、um, particular, with COVID, we've all had to pivot incredibly quickly to do that. And I think, as Edward mentioned, the benefit the the way to do that is to build on the platforms you already have,、um, such as the online sales, which both Christie's and Sotheby's had an incredibly strong base. Which has just grown exponentially over the last year and a half.、Um, I mean, technology is very quick, but I, it, 
in my experience, it never adapts as quickly as you want it to. You know, I would love to be able to send out holograms. Um, we work it, it, in an industry which is three dimensional. And that for me is always a challenge uh, of how do you give somebody who's halfway across the world that experience of holding an object in their hands and the feel of it and the weight of it. Um, that I feel like technology isn't really there yet. Um, would a hologram help? Maybe, I mean, you can get three dimensional views so you can spin around. Um, they're not entirely satisfactory, I, I don't think. Um, I'd love to hear if somebody disagrees with me. So there, there's definitely room to grow. But I think a lot of our buyers, I mean, for example, the thing that the, the platform that's had the most uh, impact for us in the Chinese works of art market is WeChat. And that is you know, what is used throughout China uh, and the Chinese speaking world. Um, why would we want to try and reinvent that? What we want to do is have the most user friendly and biggest presence on WeChat. Uh, and Christie's is the, is the only auction house that has a full program of WeChat that is like getting into the Christie's app, but on WeChat. So all of our buyers, you know, they don't have to adapt their day-to-day -day usage. They use the app they all use every single day for, for almost every function in China, but Christie's is there for them. Thank you. It's re really interesting to hear. Just before I turn to you, Edward, then, Olivia, you, you mentioned the kind of the three-dimensional images, um, but alluded to other sensory experiences of an object that were lacking with that. I mean, what if we were to take one of your examples, say the, uh, the, the blue and white um, Rockefeller bowl that you spoke about, what would you be looking for when you engage with that, when you touch that, that isn't possible to see simply through an image? Well, I think weight is hugely important for any of us who work in objects. The first thing you want to do is pick it up. And I still find it immensely frustrating when I go to a museum and I can't reach inside the case and feel it. Um, and that also goes to the authenticity question because the first thing you wanna do is turn it over, look at the base, look at the mark, um, get a sense of the material. And that's what we all do as specialists all day, every day. So again, trying to convey that to a buyer who's halfway around, halfway around the world is extremely difficult. I mean, we've done um, live stream conversations with buyers, you can have it one-on-one -on -one or you can have it uh, on a multiple streaming platform over WeChat so that buyers can actually see us handling the pieces and ask questions in real time. And then you're kind of getting towards that, that proximity to the object, which COVID is currently denying us. Mm, thank you. Um, so Edward, uh, turning to you then, perhaps you could give us some, some examples very specifically from your, your sectors, the, the Indian and Islamic art worlds that you cover in, in, a, in a global platform for Sotheby's. Um, what are the, to what extent are the, the new digital engagements you're, 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 you're capitalizing on innovations and to what extent are they a kind of uh, a, a doubling down, if you will, on existing technologies and approaches? Well, we're in a transitional phase. So we're embracing hybridity at the moment. Mm. So we're, we're trying to, um, to, to pioneer and engage with innovation, but also um, to keep the best in, in our traditional formats and um, our traditional offerings. Um, in, in direct answer to your first question, Malcolm, I think that the format of auctions has changed fundamentally, mm -hmm. um, certainly in, in the current time. Um, whether that will continue as we come out of COVID uh, remains to be seen. Uh, the one thing that hasn't changed is, is the sort of the soul of the auction. And the soul of the auction is, is the art itself. Um, and what you see at the moment in this hybrid transitional stage is um, a, a mix of, of demands because, because we're a service industry and a client first industry um, and we're driven by the needs of our clients. Um, ma many, of, many of our sellers still want the traditional format. They, they want a physical catalog, mm. uh, particularly a single owner sale. They want a sort of testimonial what's also known sort of internally as a vanity catalogue. So they, they, they want the sort of legacy item of the catalogue, which shows the, the sort of um, their collection um, and will sit on the shelf in perpetuity. Uh, but they, they're also attracted um, to the, um, the extraordinarily wide, widened outreach that the that digital media um, allows uh, and um, the... For instance, it, it, you asked me specifically about Islamic and Indian, and we, we, we're handling a single owner collection at the moment where the owner wants a physical catalog, but also you know, they, they want all the advantages 
or the sort of dual advantages of of the the beautiful physical offering, but also an an immersive and um, high tech digital catalog, you know, with rotating shots, etc. Mm. Um, the nothing will um, because we're relationship driven. Um, nothing will re replace the sort of physical encounter. And that's the relationship with the object and the relationship with the client. Um, the, there's, there's no substitute for handling an object. I think we all know that. Anybody who's in, engaged in, in certainly in the decorative arts, um, we, um, there's a, always a limit to what you can tell from an image, from a photograph. And, and any um, email or online valuation that any auction house does will carry the disclaimer subject to first-hand inspection. And, you know, and often when you're faced with the object, you get a very different impression. Um, and likewise with clients, frankly, you know, there, there is no substitute for, for actually encountering the object and encountering clients um, in the flesh. One of my former colleagues, Philip Hook, used to work in the impressionist department at Sotheby's, uh, wrote an article in the art newspaper in which he compared online only auctions to online dating. And he, he said, uh, it's only in the flesh that sparks fly. And I mean, it's, it's a crude analogy, but there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Mm. Um, and I think the, the, the sort of electric and theatrical element of, of the live auction um, will never go away. Um, and I hope very much that we will return to um, to, to the live physical auction as, as soon as possible. Mm. And, and I think there's, a, there's a, a strong appetite amongst our clients to you know, come back together um, and to, um, to re-engage with the wider art community because um, collectors, are, collectors and art world specialists are very social. Um, there's a lot of um, socializing that accompanies working for an auction house or being a dealer or collecting. Um, the sort of reclusive collector is the exception. Um, and most collectors um, do not collect in a vacuum. They are um, very competitive with other collectors um, and they want to engage and form relationships within, with the auction house specialists and you know, be part of that community. It's part of the pleasure of collecting. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, 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 interesting to hear the way you describe the kind of that and oh, you, you borrow your, your colleague's analogy of the, the online dating and, and online um, auctions. I mean, I really wonder if you are 40% of your under 40, your, your 40 under 40, if you will, that kind of demographic you were alluding to would entirely agree with you there, whether, and we've certainly seen that in a, a much a different element of the higher education system where um, kind of digital native experience has led to much more intuitive adaptation. But as you say, there is a kind of a haptic, a personal and almost erratic experience of encountering an object that really is difficult to, to supplant elsewhere. So, so thank you, Edward, for, for those comments. Um, Could I just add, Malcolm, and the, yeah. of course, the 40% the are under 40, but at least 60% who are over 40. And I think 20% um, of them are over 70. So there are still a lot of dinosaurs roaming the sort of post-asteroid Earth. And, and those, those people, are, many of them are reluctant digital natives. And, and many of them actually don't even have computers. Right. I mean, I, I have clients who, who, do, who don't, I mean, for, for, for whom I actually have to print the whole catalog. If we don't have a physical catalog, I will have to print the whole catalog um, from the web, down, download it from the website and then post it to them. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's, there's, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, as you were saying, the, the kind of the expectations of a, a Sotheby's or a Christie's client, um, when new technologies become available is quite, quite understandably not going to be to, to drop one and have the other, but instead to say, I will have both, please. Um, that, that certainly sounds, sounds familiar and to some extent um, uh, expected. Um, so we have two questions coming in from our, our audience now, um, which I'd like to read, read to you. They, they cover really the same ground here. So one comes from Victoria Agnew, one of our alumni and a current MA student at SOAS. And one comes from my colleague, Charlotte Horlick, a senior lecturer in Korean art history here at SOAS. Um, and both of them are asking at, at the core of this, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase here as the questions really overlap, whether or not in this pivot to online auctions with an increased volume of, of sales traffic online, are you seeing a lot of contestation or buyer's regret or perhaps some, um, or, or a different kind of aftermath to the auction or, or after experience? Do you, do you find that the, the, 
the buyers have queries about authenticity more frequently if they buy online or if there are other, other issues that arise. Uh, perhaps we can start with, um, with, with you, Evan. Well, it's a very good question. And it was certainly a serious concern for me, um, and particularly with um, online only sales. Um, uh, buyers within the EU have this right of return. Mm. There's, a, uh, there's a sort of 14 day right of return because you're essentially buying a, uh, an online product and it's no different to buying a shirt or a pair of shoes. Mm. And um, I was. Um, I think we were all holding our breath, thinking, oh, God, you know, things are going to uh, we're going to end up with lots of cancelled sales. And in fact, there's not a single, in my experience, not a sim single example of that. Mm. Um, of course, everything carries the same five year warranty of authenticity that um, Christie's and Sotheby's and all the other auction houses, I believe. I, I think Bonham's actually carry a seven year warranty of, of authenticity for of everything that we sell. Uh, both at auction and privately. Um, so there's that sort of that um, comfort safety net in place for the buyer. Um, but no, it, it doesn't, it, it hasn't uh, led to a sort of plethora of dissatisfied customers returning goods that they weren't able to handle firsthand and are now disappointed with. And Olivia? Well, I, I would completely agree with Edward. I mean, fortunately, um, again, it was a huge concern once you start to put higher value lots into an online context or even in a live sale that, that bidders are bidding on pieces that they haven't seen in real life. Mm. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy to say, no, there's, there's been no increase in, in returned lots or, or, or questioned lots. And I think, again, that goes to the trust that the buyers have in the, the brands of, of Christie's and the brand of Sotheby's and, and other major auction houses that we do our due diligence, we do our research. Mm. Um, and that hasn't, that st those standards haven't slipped just because COVID's in place. Um, and we stand by the lots that, that we sell. So um, fortunately our buyers still believe in us. Mm. Thank you. Um, so I, as, a, as a final question then I think for this, this panel, I want to kind of pivot back towards some of the earlier discussions we've been having today, particularly the conversations that are centered around museums and, and institutional collections. Um, Olivia, you mentioned a couple of quite prominent sales of, um, uh, of, of works from institutional collections that have been sold um, at the kind of the top end of the value chain and, and, and slightly lower down within the spectrum of what you offer in Sotheby, uh, sorry, sorry, in Christie's New York. Sorry. Um, um, and Edward, you in, in, in your bio that you kindly provided us with, you, you mentioned a number of experiences you've had prior to working with Sotheby's or perhaps alongside in, in working in archaeological and museum institutional contexts. So I'd, I'd really like to ask a bit more about the the relationship between cultural institutions and museums and the art market. And, and perhaps we can turn to you first, Olivia. And in your case, I'm particularly interested in the process and perhaps also the impact of, of deaccessioning on a museum. I mean, as you said, there was a lot of conversations around the, uh, the prominent sales you've had from Japanese collections particularly, but, but what did the museums, what, drew, what, what position were they in to inspire them to make that choice? And what were the consequences of the sale for the museum in addition to the obvious kind of removal of objects from their collections? Yes, I mean, I think I, I'm not sure I'm the most qualified to speak to this, it should be the curators. Um, so mm. maybe another panel discussion one day <laughs> and we can get their side of the story. The, the museum deaccessions that I have worked on have been pre-COVID. So before that directive uh, that I mentioned came in place, um, just as an aside, I know there've been a lot of critical articles in the New York Times, for example, about museums deaccessioning what might be considered core or major parts of their collections. Mm. This is in post-war departments, not, not Chinese, not Asian. Um, but I think for, from what drove the, drives the deaccessions and, and how that impacts the museum, I assume the, uh, the drive is mostly from the point of uh, collections management. Um, and I'm sure that those of uh, the curators on this on this on this day of discussions will attest to the fact that there is an enormous amount in most museums, or at least the ma major museums, of which many are not actually very significant pieces. Um, for anyone who's interested, go and look up the Christie's Met sale from 2016. Yes, we had a vase that sold for for two million dollars, way above what market price would be if it weren't from the Met. But there was also an online sale of lots that were valued at you know 800 to 1200 US dollars. Um, and they were not very important pieces, but it's buyers were so excited to have the opportunity to, to 
own a piece that had been in the Met and had a part of that history. So from a museum perspective, and I, I fully understand that, you know, the museum curators in, in Europe and in London uh, who may not have ever considered this may have a very different viewpoint. But the American viewpoint is that it makes sense to do that curation of the collection, to not take up space, not take up resources to look after these pieces and instead use those funds for something that helps to build the collection and benefits the public. Thank you. Um, Edward, would you, you care to comment on how the, um, whether, whether through sort of sales of deaccessioned objects or, or other platforms that you're, how do you engage with um, museums and cultural institutions in, in your role at Sotheby's? Well, I think the whole question of, of deaccession is, is um, ethically and emotionally um, fraught and is often brought, brought on by um, financially fraught circumstances. And the few museums that I've worked with, um, what, one of the most important criteria for them in considering their decision to deaccession um, and I'm talking specifically about Islamic and Indian artifacts. Uh, one of the most important considerations was that the, the major players, the major buyers in the art market at the moment in those areas, Islamic and Indian, are, are other museums, um, particularly museums in, in the region, in the MENA region. Um, so um, it was a considerable comfort to be gained from the fact that knowing that um, objects that, which would be deaccession by say museums in America uh, would be going to into other institutions where they would remain on public display um, and be available to scholars to study and that they wouldn't disappear into private collections. Um, and it's the new sort of startup museums in the Gulf and further afield uh, that are driving the Islamic market at the moment. And I think there's um, that, that, that fact is often overlooked uh, collecting is, is often sort of stereotyped as, as a cabal of, of, of private individuals, and that's absolutely not the case at all. Um, the Islamic market is dominated by institutional buyers at the top end, and basically all the major pieces that we sell go into public collections. And that is a, a, a source of um, considerable satisfaction to me on the one hand, but also I think regret to some of my younger colleagues because we will never see those objects back on the market. Um, so, I mean, we, we like to, it, it, ob objects are, are constantly turned over in the market and, and many things that we sell have been sold before. Mm. Um, but uh, in the Islamic world, um, if you think of the museum in Doha, for instance, you know, that's a collection that didn't exist in 1990. And it's now one of the most important collections of Islamic art in the world. And those were all pieces that were sourced at auction or privately and, you know, came out of attics, cupboards, some deaccession by other museums and, and are now um, displayed in um, extraordinary um, state of the arts um, of gallery displays in Doha. And, and those of you who haven't visited Doha, the Museum of Islamic Art, I would urge you to do so because it's a stunning building by I.M. Pei and a, and a truly remarkable, world-beating, world-class collection. Well, thank you, Edward, and, and thank you again, Olivia. I think this has been a really um, um, uh, wonderfully fruitful conversation with many more things we, we could discuss, many more directions this could go. Um, we indeed have a couple more questions that just come in from the audience. In fact, a third one coming in now, all of them coming in as we're, we're running short of time here. Um, a few of them comments, um, a few of them perhaps more questions, but all um, really engaged with the, the, the function of the art market and its relationship, whether it's the ability of auction houses to kind of um, to, to reshape what might constitute cultural appropriation, you know, a kind of a neutral mechanism or a, a kind of a, a capitalist rather than um, a national mechanism for the movement of objects. Others commenting on the possibilities of, of, of new collectors being um, engaging with material and, and new kinds of engagements forming through the deaccessioning of, of things found in museums um, and, and others talking and drawing comparisons to um, elements of, uh, of curation and, um, and museum practices elsewhere in Europe as well. So I'm sorry for those who are posting these in the chat that we don't, don't have the chance to, um, uh, to answer all these questions now. We've already slightly over time. I'd like to thank Olivia and Edward once again for their, their time, their generosity in an extremely busy period. Uh, 
Um, Olivia, in fact, I, I, you mentioned you were on catalogue deadline at the moment, so I, I know how pressured that is, and we really appreciate you making the time. And uh, Edward, you're joining us, uh, I believe, while the rest of your family are off enjoying the, the Austrian Alps, and you have chosen instead to spend the time on Zoom with us. So thank you both for, for, for incorporating us into your uh, into today and, um, and for your insights, your commitment to the programme. Um, and thank you once again for being here. Hetty, I, I imagine you'd like to... I, I just really wanted to say to... Edward, who goes right back to the beginning with me, and I always saw your brilliance, Edward, don't you dare sort of run yourself down by that story. Um, so Edward, right from the beginning, Olivia, much closer to, to now, to the time, much closer to now. Uh, so thank you both of you very much for all you've brought today. And I, I don't know if now is the time for me Malcolm, to say uh, goodbye or not, is not quite yet. We have okay. one one more kind of testimonial to go okay. to. So I, okay. just before okay. I, I hand over to Hetty to kind of close and close out the day and thank, um, I'd like to invite Patrick to to bring up another testimonial from from one more of our scholarship students, um, Bianca Dolphin, who's completed this year and um, has just uh, in her final module has has landed a job at a, a major uh, international auction house. Um, and I'd like to welcome Patrick to, to to load a short testimonial from Bianca on the impact of her her half fee scholarship and to show what the um, uh, what the what the diploma has done for her and indeed what the generosity of, of those who supported our course have um, have enabled her to achieve. Hi everyone, my name is Bianca and I'm happy to share with you my journey at the SOAS postgraduate diploma in Asian art. Uh, when I applied for the program a year ago, actually now. I was stuck in Hong Kong in the middle of a pandemic without many perspectives there. Therefore, when I actually was accepted to the diploma and even more honored to receive an Alfie scholarship, I really got that confidence boost that helped me to cope with such a difficult period. I'm currently actually finishing my third module, which I've been following while moving to London and starting a new full-time position in an international auction house. Not easy, of course, to combine the two, but the enormous benefit of the postgraduate diploma is that it allows you to do so, plus the fame of the program is so well spread among people working in this field that all my colleagues have been extremely supportive through my journey. And I can say that, that if you're willing to dedicate to the postgraduate diploma in Asian art, um, you're willing to really go for it, it will really be extremely rewarding. I've been lucky to have such passionate conveners who are eager to share their knowledge with the class. Not only they have done a brilliant job uh, in the past year to adapt to what normally is an in-person teaching to the new online format that we have been following, but they took advantage of it. My fellow students and I, in fact, uh, had lectured by best scholars in the field from literally around the world. And working myself in the art market, um, I can say that I've always been fascinated by this course uh, and uh, its object-focused approach. All my previous knowledge in the field came from direct handling and working with Asian works of art. But I have to say that even after years of working in this industry, I felt that my knowledge was quite scattered based on what I've been actually lucky to step across. So the three models of the diploma that I attended um, gave me that in-depth analysis and structure that I don't think it's possible to achieve without an academic path. The Diploma in Asian Art offered by SOAS is by far the best program in the field, and I would recommend it to anyone interested in having a career in the art world. But not only, because among my classmates, there were people with the most varied background, which I think it actually helped to look at several issues from different angles. I did love the teaching approach of SOAS, and uh, I can only say that I'm really going to miss it deeply. And uh, I want to say a big thank to everyone who has been part of this uh, here journey, and good luck to all the future students, because uh, you are in good hands. Thank you.